Uh, I want to thank Timothy for the testimony that he shared. It was a blessing to me also. And uh, just one aspect of what Timothy shared, I want to reiterate that the discipline of reading through scripture is the one discipline that has changed my life at least. I know that's true for Timothy, and I'm sure it is true for everyone who has taken a responsibility or a decision to read through scripture from beginning to end. I follow, this is just to help you if you want to, I follow a reading plan where I read three parts of scripture each day. One Old Testament, one in the New Testament, uh, probably the Gospels, uh, or the epistles, and the end my, of my day, it is either a psalm or a proverb. A request once again for these lights, uh, if you can switch it off. Thank you so much. Yeah, so uh, if you can make a decision to read through scripture, believe me, it is completely life transforming. It, will, it has transformed Timothy's life. It has transformed my life. And I'm sure uh, there are many, I don't know how many of you have a discipline of reading through scripture, not reading scripture by itself. You know, sometimes we have a habit of reading just the Gospels or just reading the Psalms or Proverbs, but reading the entire counsel of God, the entire wisdom of God. And, it, and today, you have plenty of reading plans available online. If you want, if you read three chapters a day, you will cover the entire Bible in one year. It's not so difficult. No, I want to challenge you, take away time that you spend on WhatsApp, Instagram and Facebook and put it into reading the Bible. You will find you don't have to make an enormous sacrifice reading WhatsApp and uh, seeing the status updates and uh, other things are not going to build you up. What's going to really build you up is the word of God and uh, invest yourself over there. So thank you once again, Timothy, for sharing that aspect of uh, scripture. Uh, dealing with deep-rooted sin, it's very hard and only the Spirit of God ministering through the power of His Word as the work of the Holy Spirit can bring that transformation into our lives. Uh, this evening, I'm going to look at uh, the challenge of the cross. Now, suppose now, pay attention, you enter a shop which does not have a name board. Okay, and it does not display outside what kind of business it is doing. But when you go in, you see that in that shop, there is rice, there is dal, there is wheat, there is oil, there is uh, salt, there is chili, etc. You know, all these kind of things. What is the conclusion you will draw? What kind of a shop is it? Kirana, okay? Kirana or a grocery shop. By just seeing what is inside, even if a board did not say it is a grocery shop, you would know what is inside. Suppose you go into another shop, and again the shop does not have a board outside, and inside you find that there are computers being displayed, there are tablets, there are mobile phones, there are Bluetooth speakers, uh, there are some cables lying around, uh, ear, uh, ear pods, uh, you know, all kinds of things like that, headphones, etc. What kind of a shop do you think it is? Sorry? Electronic or a computer and accessory store, kind of uh, roughly there, right? That's what you would conclude. Uh, suppose you go to a shop and there are chandeliers hanging there. There is wall scones. There is different kinds of lamps over there. What kind of a shop do you think you're in? Okay, it's a lighting store. Imagine a stranger who comes to a church without knowing anything about the gospel, without knowing anything about Jesus, without knowing anything about God. He comes into a Christian church and he's been brought up in a completely non-Christian culture. So he doesn't know anything about Christians or what their associations are. And as he comes to the building, he sees that this is a great, magnificent building. And when he looks up, he looks up and sees there is a tall spire that is there on 
the front or the middle of the structure and on top of the spire is a cross. So he makes a mental observation of it and he sees that there is a cross at the top and then he starts entering the building. And as he enters the building, he notices there are huge doors, but on the doors are also engraved some symbols and he looks closely and the symbol seems to be that of a cross. Now he's waiting for the service to begin and notices that the organ starts playing and that some men come from behind. There are men with one person holding in his hand a cross. And then he notices that the shape of the church is also like a cross. What would this stranger conclude? He would conclude that the people over here think most highly about a cross. Am I right? Because he sees a cross on the top, he sees a cross on the door, he sees a structure of the, you know, most of the older Anglican churches have a structure which is cross-shaped. Uh, in a high Anglican service, there is someone who walks in with the cross in the front, the vestments and the altar. In fact, today, if you, all these days you've noticed that very often the backdrop is of a cross. You know, he would realize that this cross is something that is important to these people who are gathered in the church. And then if he listens to the songs and he hears somebody, the choir singing the song, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. He'll be sure and confirmed that there is something special to these people about the cross. Nothing seems to be more important to them than the cross. Now it is very interesting, you know, the other day I was just walking around this structure and I saw one car parked over there and in the front uh, under the rear view mirror, the owner had parked, uh, had put a cross which was made of beads and uh, obviously that is a reminder to the owner again that he or she is a follower or a disciple of somebody who died on a cross. Now it's interesting that the symbol for the Christian faith is not a crib or a manger. I know we celebrate Christmas with the greatest gusto of all Christian festivals. It is Christmas that gets the greatest attention. Am I right? But it is not a crib. It is not a manger. It is not the image of a lame man walking. As we saw this morning, Jesus healed many, the lame were walking, the blind were able to see, the deaf were able to hear, but it's none of the symbols of healing. He raised people from the dead, but none of those are the symbols of the Christian faith. The only symbol of the Christian faith is the cross. The cross is central to the Christian faith. And this evening, I'm going to spend time looking at the cross of Christ, the challenge that the cross of Christ brings into our lives. Stephen Nail says, in the Christian theology of history, the death of Christ is the central point of history. Here, all the roads of the past converge, and from here, all the roads of the future diverge. The cross of Christ is a central point of human history. The cross of Christ is a central point of human history. From here, all the roads of the past, all of them come and converge over here. They come to the same place and from here, they diverge to all other places. The cross is central to the Christian message and it is the cross that is central to the Christian faith. I'm sure many of us know the hymn called The Old Rugged Cross. And in the hymn, one of the words says, one of the verses say, O oh, the old rugged cross, so despised by the world, has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. You know, it's interesting that we have 
the cross as a symbol of our faith. You know why it's interesting? Think about it for a moment. We said it's not the crib, it's not the lame walking, it's not the blind seeing, it's not the dead raised, it is all about the cross. Now imagine a religion which is, their central symbol is the hangman's noose. Or the central symbol is an electric chair. Or the central symbol is a lethal injection, a syringe which shows a lethal injection. That is the equivalent of the cross as the symbol of the Christian faith. It is an instrument of death. The cross is the symbol or the instrument of death. Michael Green in his book, The Empty Cross of Jesus, talks about Jesus but focuses on his crucifixion. He summarizes so much that I prefer quoting him rather than speaking directly. Let me read. He was a traveling teacher, a jobbing builder by trade, and had fallen foul of the authorities. After a parody of a trial, he was led out to die outside the city walls of Jerusalem, the main town of one of the most insignificant provinces on the edge of the Roman map. The year was AD 30, the time nine o'clock in the morning. They crucified him. Not at all pleasant, but it happened to a great many people in those days. No worse than what takes place in the torture chambers of more than 70 countries in the modern world. And yet it has become the most famous death in history. It has become the most famous death in history. The agony of crucifixion was terrible beyond words, but it was not uncommon. In the unrest that had followed the death of Herod the Great in 4 BC, the Roman general had crucified 2,000 men and lined the road from Sepphoris in Galilee with them. Jesus had certainly heard of this. He had probably seen crucifixions. His execution was one among many in that barbarous age. Why then was his death so special? There were many others, thousands who have been crucified. There are thousands across the world even today. And as Michael Green points out, in more than 70 countries across the world where people are tortured more hideously then Jesus was tortured, physically at least. But why is it that Christ's death is the most famous death in history? We just get a quick glimpse of it in the opening chapters of the Gospel of John. In John chapter 1, uh, he's introduced as the word that was eternal. But then after that we can see John the Baptist is introduced and what John the Baptist does is he's the one who is pointing to Jesus. In John chapter 1, verse 29, he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Behold, he's pointing to Jesus and he's saying, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. By the way, that is not complimentary. Because to the Jew, the Lamb was what was being sacrificed daily. Every morning and every evening, a lamb was being sacrificed in the temple. Not only was it every morning and every evening, on the Sabbath there were additional sacrifices. On the feasts of the Jews there were additional sacrifices. In Pentecost there was additional sacrifices. So all uh, through the year, sorry Passover, Pentecost comes in the New Age, uh, Christian Age. But uh, in the Passover there were more sacrifices. And all of them included the sacrifice of a lamb. You know in today's language, I don't know how many of you are comfortable with uh, Hindi slang language. You're getting it? You know, you're not saying a compliment when you say, Dek o bakra hai. You know, what you're saying is, he is a sacrifice. And John the Baptist points to Jesus and says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 
Now, just want to just catch our attention quickly before we come back here. When you rush through into the New Testament, into the book of Revelation, and you get a glimpse of heaven and a glimpse of eternity, in Revelation 22, the very last chapter of the Bible, in verse 3, it says, There will no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his bond servants will save him, serve him. You know, even in eternity, it is not that John the Baptist is pointed to him as the lamb. Even in eternity, you will find that on the throne of God, there will be the throne of God and on it, there will be the lamb of God. He continues to be the lamb who was slain. I'm going to look at four words. The four words are voluntary, uh, vicari uh, vicious, Vicarious and victory. All four are we. Uh, for those who like reading, I would recommend a book by John Stott called The Cross of Christ. I have drawn most of this material in the following section from John Stott's book. I've used a very little bit of it, but his book is very vast and in much depth. But I'm just using some material from John Stott's book. The four V's, voluntary, vicious, vicarious and victory. Now, some of you have switched off your mind saying these are words I don't understand. What is vicarious? We'll explain as we come along. So one of the benefits of learning the Christian faith is that you can learn new words. You know, my early days were spent teaching uh, uh, technology. I was teaching technology in the 90s, IT. I was in the IT industry as it's popularly known. And I used to be in the training department and we used to have corporate clients. And, uh, you know, those days, you couldn't, we didn't have icons on the screen. You know, nowadays, you just have to move your pointer or move your mouse and get your icon and click on it. In those days, we had to type commands. You know, so suppose we wanted to see what all files were there. We had to, if it was a DOS system, we had to type DIR, you know, basically. So we had to memorize commands for various things to be done. So all the programs we used to have were all written programs. And very hard to teach this to people who aren't inclined to computers. So among ourselves, we had a dictum. Those of us who were the faculty who were teaching computers, we used to speak about what we ought to do. The simple dictum was, if you can't convince them, confuse them. You know, so use some big words and confuse them. They are lost. And while they are lost, continue and finish your portion. I know many lecturers do that even today. They don't pause for everyone to understand. But these words are not meant to confuse. They're important words. We need to know and understand their meaning. Now, the first word, let us look at the first word, the word voluntary. I don't know how many of you have seen a video of a man who is supposed to control the drawbridge of a railway track. There is a railway track that comes from one end and goes in between is a river. The bridge doesn't go across, but it is a drawbridge because the bridge is kept in a way so that ships can pass along the river when the bridge is kept perpendicular to the shore. And when a train comes, the drawbridge is turned so that it aligns with the track. How many of you have seen that video? I'm sure many of you have seen that video. So here is the father who is responsible for controlling that drawbridge. And he's supposed to make sure that every time a train is coming, so the train comes this way and the bridge has to, this is the bridge, this has to be aligned and the train will go on. But when a train is not coming, the bridge is kept in a perpendicular position. So if a train comes, it can't cross. So this man is responsible for making sure that the train can pass, you know, and he has to turn the drawbridge so that the train will go on, cross the river, and pass on to the other side. Now, in that story, in that video that you have seen, uh, the father is sitting over there, preparing to turn the drawbridge so that the next express train that is coming can pass. And while he's waiting for the train to come, and he's ready to pull the lever so that the drawbridge can be and, uh, can be used. Uh, there are seats up here in the front. If those of you, uh, if you're looking for seats, are you looking for seats? There's place in the front. Yeah. Okay. Let's come back. Oh, okay. So, 
as he is about to pull the lever to make the drawbridge aligned with the railway track so that this express train can pass what happens at that time is he sees his child is playing on the track on the other side and now he knows that if he turns the drawbridge and aligns it with the track the train will come at full speed will not see the child will just run through and run over his child now the father is facing this dilemma the dilemma is if he does not align the railway line all the people in the train will perish because the entire express train will go into that river and all or many or most would perish but if he aligns the track what would happen is that the train would come through run through the tracks and crush his son he is caught in this dilemma and in that video you know there is that moment when he is struggling on whether to pull it or not pull it so that the train can pass and finally the story tells us that the father with tears in his eyes pulls the lever the tracks are aligned so that the express train can pass and his son perishes but he saves the lives of so many and then the story tells us that that is what jesus did for us he died because the father was saving our life now what i want to tell you about that illustration is that it is a wrong illustration you know why it is wrong because jesus fully well knew that he was going to die that death on the cross he was not caught by surprise like that child would the child was unaware that the father had to make a choice between saving the lives of the passengers and his life the child was completely unaware he was just playing over there but in the bible we know jesus knew all along so as soon as the disciples confessed that jesus is messiah he they asked he asked his disciples who do men say that i am and they replied elijah some said the prophet then he asked him who do you say i am he they said that he is the messiah what happens immediately after that he starts teaching them that he must suffer he must die and he must be rejected so jesus was fully aware of that it was not that he was caught unawares he was fully aware that the son of man came to die on the cross in john's gospel john chapter 10 he talks about himself as the good shepherd and then he says the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep in verse 17 and 18 he says for this reason the father loves me because i lay down my life so that i may take it up again no one has taken it up from me i lay it down on my own initiative i have the authority to lay it down and i have the authority to take it up again this commandment i received from the father the first we his death on the cross was voluntary he chose to die it is not a death that was imposed on him by the first person in the triune godhead the father did not force it upon him the father did not catch him unawares and make him die but he knew very well that he was going to die and in john's gospel he says very clearly i lay down my life i lay down my life and i will take it up take it up again and then he reiterates it i lay it down on my own initiative it is his own initiative that he lays it down and he says i have the authority to take it up again jesus died voluntarily it was not forced upon him no one there was no peer pressure upon him there was no one who forced him to die on the cross he chose to die on the cross the second we we want to look at is the word wishes i don't know how many of you have heard of a russian monk called rasputin okay if you have ever listened to bonium songs you would have heard the song called rasputin 
Okay, Rasputin was a mad Russian monk, or at least they considered him to be mad, and he was assassinated in Petrograd in the year 1918. Now, to assassinate him, listen to what they did to him. They first fed him with cakes laced with enough cyanide to kill multiple men. Nothing happened to him. He ate cakes which were full of cyanide. There was enough cyanide to kill several people. Nothing happened to him. Then Prince Felix Yusupov, he shot him through the chest. After he had eaten cyanide, he shot him through the chest and nothing happened to him. And then they clubbed him on the head with a lead stick. Lead is very heavy and they clubbed him on the head with a lead stick and yet he did not die. They finally threw him into the river, the Neva River. And interestingly, the autopsy showed that he did not die of the cyanide. He did not die of the bullet wound. He did not die of the clubbing on the head, but he died of drowning. Now you would think that this is a lot of pain and abuse a person had gone through. But we see that Jesus goes through far more. We're going to look at four ways in which he went through suffering. Okay, it was vicious. Vicious means it was uh, without letting our hand have a release. You know, it was a vicious suffering of his. So the first is the emotional suffering. I don't know how many of you have had friends who have betrayed you. Okay, some of you want to put your hands up. Okay, but if you have ever been betrayed by a friend, you know how deep the pain is. Jesus was betrayed by one of his inner circle of 12, Judas. Not only was he betrayed by Judas, another disciple from the remaining 11, he denied him. Who was that? Peter. And beyond that, the remaining disciples, all of them, they abandoned him after he was arrested and they all fled. Can you think of the emotional trauma of a person who has been abandoned by all those who were closest to him? He was betrayed, he was denied, and he was abandoned by the inner circle of 12. That was the emotional trauma he went through. Then the social legal aspect of it, Jesus went through six trials on that night after his crucifixion. Three of them were religious, three of them were civil. Uh, we won't go through the details of the trial. The first trial was before Annas, and in this trial before Annas, uh, the decision was taken that Jesus should be executed. From Annas, they sent him to Caiaphas. They sent him to Caiaphas and again the decision was that the death sentence should be passed on him. From there he is sent not finally to the Sanhedrin and in the Sanhedrin that is the collection of the leaders of the Jewish people the decision is again made to sentence him to death. So three trials which were religious then three trials before the Roman Empire. First was before Pilate, where he tried to avoid allowing Jesus to be killed. He said he is not guilty. But then when he heard that he came from Herod's jurisdiction, he passed him on to Herod. But Herod also made a decision which was indifferent. And then it finally came back to Pilate. And we all remember Pilate washes his hand and he says, this be upon your head. And finally, he allows the Jews to have their way. So there was the emotional suffering that he went through. There was the injustice of six trials that he had to face. In none of the trials did, did he, who was the judge of the universe, whose justice personified, receive the slightest amount of justice. He suffered through six trials. The third is the physical. We often think of only the physical, but remember, emotional trauma is very strong. For those of us who have had a friendship broken, you know how many sleepless nights you have spent because of a friendship that has broken. It's very difficult. It's very hard on us when we have a friendship broken. Emotional trauma is very hard. He was abandoned. 
by his disciples. Peter denies him and Judas betrays him. The next is the key, uh, trials. Six trials, all were sham trials. None were sincere. They allowed him to be crucified. The third aspect is the physical. You know, in the physical, we can see that he was whipped. Now, just to get an idea of what this whipping is, he wasn't whipped with just cords or strings. The Romans had a flagellum, that, as it's called in the flagrum, which had leather thongs. There were strips of leather on a stick. And the strips of leather were not just strips of leather, but on the strips of leather were pieces of iron and bone. And they were tried, tied on those strips at different intervals. So when this flagrum was struck on a prisoner or a condemned person, what would happen is the leather thongs would hit the back, but these nails and these uh, the iron nails and the bones would stick into the flesh and when it is pulled out, it would yank out a bit of the flesh. Now, I don't want to make it more gory than necessary, but the Jews used to prevent the flogging of a prisoner not more than 39 times. But the Romans had no limit. They were quite heartless and they whipped him. Now, not only did they whip him, they went beyond that and we see that they placed a crown of thorns on his head. And the crown of thorns, not only did they place it on the head, it was not gently placed over there like we would like to imagine. It was placed on his head and you see that the soldiers then after that clubbed him. So when they were clubbing him, imagine what was happening. Those thorns were each time a club was brought, was digging into his head. And for most of us who have had even a small head injury, you know that the bleeding is most severe in the portion of our skull. So from the head would have flowed large amounts of blood and it would be mixed with the sweat and mud that was there on the face of the condemned person. Then the victim was asked to carry his own cross. It would probably weigh 50 to 60 kilos by itself. It was just the vertical bar he had to carry. The cross did not come ready-made like that, just the vertical bar he had to carry. And finally, they would crucify him. How was the method of crucifixion? We often think the pictures are all of it on the palm of the hand. But if a nail is pierced through the palm of the hand, the flesh will rip out and the nail will not hold the person. Remember, you are being held by those nails. So it is actually through the wrist that the nail is pierced and through the wrist and into the cross. The Romans never allowed a Roman citizen to be crucified because it was considered to be the most hideous of deaths. There were historians who called it the most cruel and torturous of deaths. Will Durant, the great histor historian of philosophy, he says even the Romans pitied the victim who was crucified. Jo Flavius Josephus, the Jewish historian who lived around the time of Jesus, he says it was the most wretched of deaths. Now, how did a person who was crucified die? You know, each of us, when we breathe, we don't realize it, that we take the pressure of our breathing through either our feet when we are standing or when we are sitting, we take the support of the portion that is in contact with the chair. Truman Davis, uh, uh, MD in medicine, he describes how death comes upon a person who is crucified. As the muscles fatigue, great waves of cramps sweep over the muscles, knotting them in deep, relentless, throbbing pain. With these cramps come the inability to push himself upward. Hanging by his arm, the pectoral muscles are paralyzed. The intercostal muscles are unable to act. Air cannot be drawn into the lungs, but cannot be exhaled either. Jesus fights to raise himself for every breath. Finally, carbon dioxide builds up in the lungs and in the blood streams and the cramps subside. He is able to push himself upward to exhale a bit and finally he would die. And if a prisoner did not die by the hanging on the cross, they would break his feet. And you see the record that they came to Jesus and they saw that he was already 
dead but otherwise they would break his feet so that breathing became completely so painful that the person would stop breathing itself so the physical pain that jesus went through was very intense so you can see that there was a emotional trauma in the cross not only was there an emotional trauma on the cross there was a social legal aspect where he finds that he's denied justice and all of us know that we spoke about it in an earlier day we desire justice and the judge of all the earth was denied any form of justice the third is the physical suffering and the fourth and the most important was the spiritual agony that he suffered on the cross he cries out matthew chapter 27 verse 46 in the ninth hour jesus called out with a loud loud voice saying eli eli lama sabachthani which simply is translated my god my god why have you forsaken me in the triune godhead the son experienced some form of a separation from the godhead so there was also the spiritual agony peter he reminds us that jesus was sinless he says he committed no sin nor was deceit found on his mouth his death was a vicious death he suffered emotionally he suffered legal injustice he suffered physically and he suffered spiritually so the first we is he died voluntarily the second we is it was vicious Let's look at the third V. It is vicarious. I don't know how many of you have had this experience. Uh, you know, we have our older, younger daughter when she was a little child. She would go and watch television, and uh, we never encouraged it. But uh, when we weren't watching, she would go and watch the television serial that her grandfather was seeing. That's my dad was seeing. and then she would come back after some time crying so when we saw her crying we knew that she had been watching television so we asked her what happened so he saying that uncle did so much bad to that auntie over there you know what was happening to her why was she crying she was experiencing the pain of another are you seeing what happens and this this happens to us even when we watch a movie or when we read a novel we experience the pain vicariously are you getting the word vicarious instead of on behalf of now jesus he died on the cross vicariously because peter says he committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth then why was he crucified let's see the third word vicarious 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 3 he says i delivered to you as of first importance what i received that christ died for our sins christ did not die for his sins christ did not die because he was evil but christ died for our sins you can see it is vicarious it is not because he sinned but because we have sinned first peter chapter 3 verse 18 says for christ also died for sins once for all the just for the unjust so that he might bring us to god having been put to death in the flesh but made alive in the spirit he died so that he who is just you remember we talked about the one who is justice personified he died on my behalf the just for the unjust now you can see something else on the cross jesus while hanging on the cross was not valuing in self pity he was not feeling sorry for himself he was not thinking about the injustice of the trials that he suffered because that's the greatest injustice any human has ever experienced but what was he doing on the cross on the cross he was showing his concern for others luke chapter 23 verse 34 it says jesus was saying father forgive them for they don't know what they do father forgive them for they do not know what they are doing when we go through the slightest of pain and if we know the one who has caused that pain 
we desire that that person will go through greater pain and through greater suffering. But Jesus, he says on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. So you can see that on the cross, he is carrying with himself absolutely no anger or bitterness towards those who put him on the cross. You know, his inner person was in complete, perfect health. The outer person was ravaged. We've seen that already. It was vicious. The suffering on him was vicious, you know, physically abused in every way possible, emotionally abandoned, legally not receiving any proper aid and spiritually experiencing uh, separation. But yet this person, Jesus, in his heart had absolutely no bitterness. The second thing we see about him, about his care for others, is John chapter 19, verses 26 and 27. John 19, verses 26 and 27. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. From that hour, the disciple took her into her, his household. Now you can see again, it's care. He's exhibiting care. Towards whom? Towards his mother. In Jewish culture, the oldest child was responsible for the well-being of his parents. And here on the cross, what you see Jesus doing is exercising responsibility as the oldest child of the house by making sure that his mother is cared for. And what does he do? He tells his mother that she is now in a new relationship. What is that new relationship? Her son is now John. And then she tells John, John, behold your mother. What is he doing over there? He is creating a relationship which is forged in his blood, in his death on the cross. And you know how that relationship lives on today? In the church, the bride of Christ. We are all brothers and sisters, parents and children, together in the community called the church. What unites us as a church, what unites us as a community is the death of Christ on the cross. And he inaugurates it by showing care for his mother and passing her responsibility to his disciple John. And that is why today the church is one who ought to care for one another. Because it's a relationship forged, it's not just a blood relation, it is the blood relationship of the Lord of the universe himself. Now, when our second child was born, we, she was born in Delhi. And uh, we lived in Delhi, but we had no family. And uh, it's very hard the first few months, especially because I used to travel a lot in those days. I used to travel at least two times a week. And... Uh, it was very difficult for someone to take care. But you know, the reason that nothing felt difficult at that time was because our church, our community stood by us. Maybe our blood relatives weren't there, but our relatives by the blood of Christ were all there. And all started because Christ on the cross starts this new relationship based on it. He is exhibiting care. So you see there is no bitterness in him. He is willing to forgive those who have hurt him. You can see that he's caring for those around him. And then you can see he speaks to the thief on the cross. And what does he tell him? The thief tells him, tells Jesus, remember me when you're coming in paradise. And Jesus' response is, today you will be with me in paradise. His confidence in knowing that there would be the resurrection and that in the resurrection, the thief would be rescued from his life. So the cross of Christ is vicarious. Christ died for us. And even when he died on the cross, his concern was still for us. He died in our place. That's what it means. He died in our place, not for any sin that he committed. There was absolutely no evil or wickedness or even deceit in his mouth. He died for our sins. 
and in on the cross he shows that the greatest thing for one to do is to care for those around no bitterness no anger no revenge only forgiveness care for those around him and the confidence that he would be raised the third day matthew chapter 16 verse 24 Therefore we get the invitation if anyone wishes to come after me he must deny himself take up his cross and follow me Let's move on to the last word the victory So if Christ's death was number 1 voluntary number 2 it was wishes number 3 it was vicarious number 4 the cross is not the symbol of defeat it is the symbol of victory a cross is not the symbol of defeat like the world thought it would be it was not putting an end but it was the beginning there are five names that are given to satan in revelation chapter 12 we won't read all those passages uh, the references are here but the names that he is called is he is called a dragon so the satan is called a dragon he is called the serpent of old he is called the devil he is called satan himself and fifthly he is called the accuser you know the picture of a dragon a dragon is monstrous nobody ever wants to have chai with a dragon right you know because you know your chai will be very hot because he will spew out fire but you wouldn't want to be in the vicinity of the dragon i don't know how many of you have seen the movies the hobbit lord of the rings you know you can there's some imagery of the dragon you know you would be scared of a dragon a dragon is monstrous the second thing he's called is a serpent a serpent is wild and cunning the third thing that he's called is the devil devil meaning he is the deceiver the fourth thing he is called he is the accuser of the brethren and we see a glimpse of that in the book of job what is happening in the book of job it is job is being accused by the devil to god god he tells god you know does he serve you for nothing you know it is because you take care of him and you provide for him that he serves you he is making an accusation that job does not love god for god's sake the fourth the fifth word he calls him is the accuser he pulls him down so in first peter we are reminded that our adversary the devil is prowling around like a roaring lion seeking how he might devour somebody Yesterday we talked about this picture. You remember the lion waiting outside, waiting to devour someone. You know, some of our lions are in this room itself. You know, who are those lions? The ones who don't want to listen, but who will not let others also listen. I've been watching this happen in the last two days. There are some who are agents of the devil who will not allow others to listen to the word of God because they don't want to listen but they will not let others listen but remember the devil is our adversary he is looking for someone he would like to devour the adversary means he is our real enemy now what are the darts that satan throws at us just to get a quick glimpse of it Colossians chapter 3 I'm going to read just three verses 5 8 and 9 Therefore consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality impurity passion evil desire and greed verse 8 put them all aside anger wrath malice slander and abusive speech from your mouth do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices now can you see these are the ways de- the devil attacks us how does he attack us you know with our evil desires our desires which are not uh, right in the eyes of the lord with greed he attacks us with feelings of anger and wrath he attacks us with malice becoming malicious and becoming slanderers and having abusive speech in the mouth 
You know, all of these are things that he does internally within us. But how can this be overcome? So we find the answer to that in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. How to overcome the darts of the enemy? He says, and they overcame him because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life even when they faced death. How did he overcome? By the blood of the lamb. The second is the word of their testimony. And third is they did not love their own life even when faced with death. Now in the cross, how is the cross the cross of victory? I'm going to read Colossians chapter 13, uh, 2 verses 13 to 15. We'll read these brief verses. Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 to 15. It says, When you were dead in your transgressions and uncircumcision of your flesh, you made us alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having cancelled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way. Having nailed it to the cross, when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. You know, what is this certificate of debt? Let me give you a picture of what is a certificate of debt. Suppose I borrow money from you. Okay, come and ask you to give me money. Okay, I come and ask, can you give me one lakh rupees? So somebody will give me one lakh rupees. But when he gives me this one lakh rupees, what he also does is he will ask for an IOU. What is an IOU? An IOU is a declaration that I am saying that I have borrowed one lakh rupees and I owe the other person that lakh. Are you with me here? So I get, he gets an IOU in place of the money that he has given me. Now what Satan had done is he has kept us in debt to him. How does he keep us in debt to him? By the spiral of sin that destroys. You know, you heard the testimony of Timothy. He keeps us in his debt by the spiral of some sin or the other. In one case, it must be uh, sexual in nature. In another, it may be greed. In another, it may be pride. In another, it may be gluttony. So he keeps us in that spiral. But this spiral is where he keeps us in debt to him. But then what Jesus did on the cross, what it says in verse 14 is he cancelled the certificate of debt. How did he cancel the certificate of debt? By nailing it on the cross. So all that Satan tells us that we owe him, he says you are an addict to this, aren't you? How can you get out of it? And all you have to do is tell him, Christ nailed it on the cross. Think about it. It's so beautiful. So when he tells you you are a victim of your own pride, you can't get out of it. What does Satan do? He says you can't escape. You are proud. You have been proud and you will continue to remain proud. But what does Jesus do? He has crucified it on the cross. He cancelled that certificate of debt. And now we can tell Satan, I am no longer indebted to you. Christ is in me and in me is that hope of glory. So you can see that the conquest was achieved by Christ paying the certificate of death on the cross. There is an old gospel song that says, when Jesus hung on Calvary, people came from miles to see. They said, if you be the Christ, come down and save your life. But Jesus, sweet Jesus, never answered them, for he knew that Satan was tempting. If he had come down from the cross, my soul would still be lost. If he had come down from the cross, my soul would still be lost. He would not come down from the cross just to save himself. He decided to die just to save me. He did not come down from the cross 
because if he had come down from the cross he would have proved them wrong that he couldn't but he would not be able to pay the price for my sin but he did not come down from the cross and he decided to die just to save me you know he became obedient to the point of death on a cross and the last verse before we stop the conquest is announced first peter chapter 3 verses 21 and 22 corresponding to that baptism now saves you not the removal of dirt from the flesh but an appeal to god for a good conscience through the resurrection of jesus christ who is at the right hand of god having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers have been subjected to him through the cross christ has become the ruler of the whole universe just to take a quick flashback the third temptation of jesus was you know i will give you the glory of all the kingdoms doesn't he do that he says i will show you the glory of all the kingdoms and i will give you the glory of all these kingdoms these will be yours he was trying to give him an escape from the cross but jesus did not come down from the cross and in peter he says he is at the right hand of the father having gone into heaven after angels and powers and authorities have been subjected to him everything is now subject to him so what does this mean for us and i'm going to close with a few thoughts on what does this mean the cross of christ is something that we need to take voluntarily it was voluntary for him to take it upon himself as disciples of jesus we need to take whichever be our cross given to us the second is it is possible that the suffering that we go through for taking the cross upon ourselves will be vicious people may hate us people may speak ill about us people may be abusive to us but remember that we need to face the vicious hand of the other because christ took it for us the third is vicarious he died in my place so that i may live for the other so i have learned to live for the other because he has died for me it's vicarious and the fourth is my christian life is a life of victory and i was thinking this evening the testimony of timothy was just perfect you know finally there is victory there is victory and the cross of christ is two things that timothy mentioned I want to bring it together at the cross you see the holiness of god and the love of god at the cross of christ he is a holy god who cannot permit sin and darkness into his presence he will not permit darkness and sin in his presence but at the same time he is a loving god he does not want to leave us or abandon us so he pays the final price so that we can come perfect into the presence of the living god that's the great love that he has for us at the cross the love and the holiness of god meet what a beautiful symbol every time you see the cross remember it's the symbol of a cost that has been paid which cannot be counted we may count for eternity but we will never be able to spill the number of words we use to talk about the glory of the cross of christ and therefore the cross is not a symbol of death it's not a symbol of defeat it's not the hangman's noose it's not the electric chair it's not the symbol of the lethal injection but it is the symbol of victory through death it's a symbol of victory through being a servant and being willing to die for the other let us pray